Now we're talking to our patient, and we ask, Ma'am, sir, about how many bites of food do you take before you start to feel full? It's a great question. If a patient says, I start to feel full after two or three bites, or I start to feel full after four or five bites, this is both a sign and a symptom called premature satiety. Premature satiety. Coming full before you've eaten enough PO intake to normally make a person feel full. So premature satiety. About how many bites of food can you take until you are full? You're stuffed. You couldn't eat another bite if your life depended upon it. Well, I start to feel full after two or three bites, and I'm absolutely stuffed after four bites. Okay? Well, when it's in close proximity, again, this is both a sign and a symptom of premature satiety. When you feel full, do you feel full in your stomach, or do you feel full in your chest, or do you feel full in your throat? Some patients may not be able to answer that. They say, I just feel full. A few patients will say, I feel full in my stomach, or I feel like it's all up in my chest, or I feel like it's down here in the bottom of my throat. It is interesting to note where the patient has these types of sensations. Oftentimes, patients who have obstructive esophageal dysphagia, especially in the distal one-third of the esophagus will point to the anterior base of the neck or the vicinity of the manubrium of the sternum and say, oh, large pills and meat or bread get stuck right here. Is there any difficulty swallowing food or pills? Does it get stuck? If so, where? Point. Show me with one finger. Show me where the pills or the food hangs up. Tell me, how often does that happen? Tell me. Does that happen more with solid food, or does it happen more with liquids? The interpretation of these findings was impaired onset of the pharyngeal swallow reflex, impaired pharyngeal constriction on the left side of the pharynx, and a questionable decrease of pharyngeal sensation. During the modified barium swallow, the speech-language pathologist and radiologist both noted that although esophageal transit time for liquids appeared grossly within functional limits, there were prolonged delays with her esophageal bolus clearance of all solid consistencies, as well as report of impaired primary and secondary peristaltic waves in the presence of tertiary contractions. However, esophageal bolus clearance of solids appeared improved with use of cyclic ingestion. The joint SLP and radiologist interpretation of the esophageal findings was that of a coexisting neurogenic esophageal dysphagia characterized by impaired esophageal motility. Our patient was discharged to a rural skilled nursing facility where dysphagia therapy initiated at the hospital continued, including labial strain task to facilitate improved labial seal lingual strengthening task as well as bolus manipulation and mastication task to facilitate improved bolus mastication as well as reduced oral holding. And last but not least, glissando task to improve pharyngeal constriction. After 14 swallow therapy visits by the speech language pathologist at the nursing home, the nursing staff noted the patient to have persistent poor oral intake of solids and liquids, as well as diminished urinary output and continued weight loss. A CSA endoscopy was then ordered by the physician at the nursing home. During the modified transnasal esophagoscopy portion of the endoscopically based CSA algorithm, it was noted the patient exhibited a reduced lumen in greater than two-thirds of her esophagus in the presence of blood, as well as significantly delayed esophageal bolus clearance of solids. Cyclic ingestion with two to three liquid swallows after each swallow of a solid bolus did appear to optimize esophageal bolus clearance. The patient was asked if she felt any pain with swallowing, and she denied not only pain with swallowing, 
but also denied a history of reflux as well as a history of heartburn. So no history of reflux, no history of heartburn, and she's saying there's no pain with her swallow. In spite of her denials of signs and symptoms consistent with laryngopharyngeal reflux, her reflux findings score was found to be a 10, which is consistent uh, with mild laryngopharyngeal reflux. Per the literature, reflux findings score greater than or equal to 5 indicates laryngopharyngeal reflux. This can be found as a reference in the study by Blasky, Posma, and Kaufman, 2001, in your bibliography. The speech-language pathologist made the physiological diagnosis of a pseudo-obstructive esophageal dysphagia. The esophageal pictures were forwarded electronically by the attending physician to a gastroenterology physician, who in turn interpreted them as consistent with hemorrhagic esophagitis. The rurally-based nursing home physician then made the diagnosis of hemorrhagic esophagitis. Assertive anti-reflux pharmacotherapy was initiated by the attending physician, consisting of a proton pump inhibitor therapy of 40 mg pantoprazole twice a day, with an H2 antagonist therapy of 150 mg of ranitidine three times a day for a 30-day period. A follow-up CSA was ordered by the attending physician after three weeks of the pharmaco-anti-reflux therapy. During the CSA, it was noted that not only had the prolonged oral holding and prolonged mastication been eliminated, but also the pharyngeal and esophageal swallow physiologies were determined to be grossly within functional limits at that time. Her reflux finding score had been reduced to 6. Upon review of the CSA images, the physician determined that the hemorrhagic esophagitis had resolved, discontinued her proton pump inhibitor therapy, and reduced her H2 antagonist therapy to 150 mg of ranitidine at hour of sleep for initial ongoing treatment of her reflux and also in hope of preventing uh, a recurrence of the uh, hemorrhagic esophagitis. In retrospect, one may feel compelled to ask how much of the initial oral and pharyngeal findings of the clinical swallow exam, as well as the modified barium swallow performed at the hospital, were as a result of the stroke, and how much of it was the result of the comorbid hemorrhagic esophagitis. There is no doubt the stroke itself also resulted in an exacerbation of the dysphagia with the left labial weakness, left pharyngeal constrictor weakness, and possibly some esophageal dysmotility. However, was there really a neurogenic esophageal dysphagia initially? Or was it a pseudo-obstructive esophageal dysphagia in need of medication initially? Or was there a comorbidity between the neurogenic esophageal dysphagia and the pseudo-obstructive esophageal dysphagia resulting from the hemorrhagic esophagitis diagnosed by the physician. Several other interesting questions were raised by her attending physician who specialized in internal medicine. How long did the hemorrhagic esophagitis precede the stroke? If the hemorrhagic esophagitis preceded the stroke, could it have been the underlying etiology to explain her decreased PO intake, her weight loss, her dehydration, and perhaps uh, the resulting urinary tract infection, which all preceded the stroke? If the answers to these first two questions are both yes, is it possible that undernutrition and dehydration exacerbated her known diagnosis of atrial fibrillation? If the answer to this third question is yes, then is it possible the resulting atrial fibrillation caused the stroke? If yes, then is it really possible that her pseudo-obstructive esophageal dysphagia was a contributing factor or perhaps the primary initial factor that led to the stroke? Indeed, these are some very interesting questions from her internal medicine physician. What lessons are offered by this one case study? Perhaps one lesson 
is to underscore the importance of holistic assessment of the upper air digestive tract's physiology when a patient presents with signs and symptoms of a dysphagia. Perhaps the importance of making an accurate, specific diagnosis of dysphagia as early as possible might lead to us choosing appropriate evidence-based treatments between therapy, medicine, and surgery at an earlier point in time. Here are some targets for lumen restoration with esophageal dilatation. At 7 millimeters diameter dilatation, one can reasonably expect for liquids and some puree to pass. At 10 millimeters, puree as well as some chewed soft foods may pass. 13 millimeters, at 13 millimeters, mechanical soft consistency foods should pass. 15 millimeters, at 15 millimeters, a mechanical soft diet excluding tough meats, harder raw vegetables and fruits, breads and some fruit or vegetable skins can be tolerated. And at 18 millimeters dilatation, a patient should be able to tolerate a regular diet if the dilatation has a prolonged therapeutic effect.